We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is the Therapy Show Behind Closed Doors podcast with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to this wonderful podcast, the Therapy Show Behind Closed Doors with myself, Jackie Jones and Bob Cook. And what we're going to be looking at in this episode is the Dr. Spock profile in therapy. What number are we up to, Jackie? 163. God, God, that's amazing. 163. Well, anyway, how it gets there, I don't know. But yeah, I picked this title again. In fact, I pick all the titles, let's be honest. You do. Let's be honest, yeah. (laughs) Nothing to do with me. (laughs) Uh, When you read them and say how wonderful they are, I hope. But um, this one's particularly interesting because people who don't know me, or if they do know me, might not know this is that I've been a Star Trek fan for a very long time. I didn't know that, Bob. No, I don't really particularly like Star Wars, but I like Star Trek. And then Star Trek Voyager uh, and so on. But in the original Star Trek, which I think started out in 1963, might be wrong with that. I mean, Doctor Who started off in 1963 and or 64, and Top of the Pops started off in 1974. So I'm actually not sure. It might be later in the 60s, but anyway. See, Bobby, it's not often I get to say this, but those are all before my time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I need to throw that in there. <laughs> oh, well, you're very fortunate here. Yeah. Um, anyway, <laughs> one of the first, one of the characters in Doctor S- <laughs> in Star Trek was a character called Spock. Yeah. And uh, Spock was, <clears throat> I mean, if you look at the United Kingdom culture, there are, well, you look at it psychologically. Often, metaphorically, you could call it a schizoid culture. Italy, you might call it a histrionic culture. America, you might call it a narcissistic culture, and so on. And Dr. Spock fits into this schizoid type of character. So very withdrawn in the sense of actually not being very proactive and also <clears throat> isn't really... Um, into feelings at all. So when I withdraw, when I say withdrawn, what I mean is withdrawn from feelings, really. That's what yeah. I ask him. Um, so contact is through thinking. So he's really an ace with logical, logical thinking. He was called a Vulcan. That's the word that always comes to mind when I think about Mr. Spock or Dr. Spock or Spock or whatever is logical. He used to say things like, that's not logical to me, Captain Kirk or whatever it is. That's (laughs) right. It was a Vulcan. Vulcans basically are, um, have repressed their feelings. So everything is through thinking. Everything is through logic. And often he gets preoccupied with overthinking. But he's repressed with feelings. So why why you can put it near the schizoid character? Um, because a schizoid character is also split in terms of cognition and feelings. I mean Spock, of course, actually really, really repressed with feelings to the extent um if feelings came along, he'd be overwhelmed with what to do with them. Yeah. Everything could transform to thinking. So if you've got a sort of Dr. Spock character in therapy, the way you would contact them, the channel you would use, would be thinking. Yeah. Now, of course, um, with that type of character, their feelings are repressed. There's a split personality in a way, if you want to call it that way. And they're out of touch with any feelings. So in the humanoid world, which is science obviously are, um, in terms of um, a healthy process, it's also about helping that type of character get in touch with their feelings so they come from a more holistic, integrated place. Yeah. Because unlike unlike Spock, um, who was a Vulcan and not a human, we're talking about humans here, 
the reason that the um, this type of character um, is so split, so that thinking is a major channel, is because they repress their feelings because of trauma. Which is similar to a lot of us, Bob, isn't it? It's through past experiences or past, yeah, negative yeah, experiences. Yeah, but, but, yeah, yeah. I mean, in the Vulcan world, it's not about has an aspect of trauma it's it's about that's what they value but in the human world i mean the clients we see you're correct i mean we all to a certain extent um may defend against trauma by defending against feelings yeah and sort of overthinking there's However, something that often clients say to me about vulnerability <laughs> and feelings or being emotional and vulnerability mm, yes yeah, so that's right so that's if they feel vulnerable, you know, and often, of course, if you had a traumatic experience, you feel very vulnerable. Absolutely, yeah. So with the type of withdrawal character I'm talking about here, um, they defend their emotions by connecting through thinking. Yeah. The problem with that may come, and if it's not a problem, I won't see them, but the problem with that that may come that in interpersonal relationships particularly they'll be out of balance if they just only can contact with contact by thinking yeah if they aren't able to integrate their feelings then intimacy closeness expressing vulnerability will be all, all be a challenge to them so when you say, you know, that making contact with them through their thinking, mm. do we get them to connect with their emotions through their thinking then kind of thing? Get them to think about feelings and emotions? Is that the first yes, step? But timing is crucial in psychotherapy. So <clears throat> we've done many podcasts on this, I think. I remember a podcast talking about timing is crucial in psychotherapy. And also a podcast talking about sequences in therapy, and also a podcast talking about how how really important it is to have a robust working relationship before therapy can happen. Yeah. So I'm talking about at the beginning of psychotherapy, because if if you you know attempt very 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 early on to ask them what they're feeling, it may be so overwhelming you won't see them again yeah so at the beginning of psychotherapy you need to build up a working relationship i think through the channel of thinking so they trust you there's a sense of rapport there's a sense of attunement and then from that position so they don't feel overwhelmed yeah you you can start to help them integrate thinking and feeling so then taking it back a step to start the the therapy and I'm not sure it's the right phrase to use, but would you buy into their logic, buy into their way of being and use your thinking as well as theirs? Yes. Okay. I, I, yeah, I don't particularly think of about buying their logic, but I know what you mean, which is that you you ask thinking questions. Yeah, yeah. That you um, develop, develop rapport by thinking. Yeah. Because their, their expression of feelings will be even if they know what feelings are, will be so overwhelming for them that you might lose that early relationship you've built. Yeah, because I would imagine, well, I, I, you know, from personal experience, I kind of know that working with people that are like that, you know, schizoid or a lot in their thinking, they can seem quite detached from you. And it's kind of impersonal and clinical. <laughs> That's, so that's I would imagine being around them a lot, it's difficult to read them because there's, there's no real emotional connection or feeling connection with them. Correct. So they will often appear aloof yeah. and detached in your language. And um, that's a defence against their vulnerability and expression of feelings yeah and with somebody who comes from that place of defending their vulnerability even if they know their feelings at that time they will appear as i said aloof detached and 
their body will be very still usually and their facial expressions will be very inflexible and often um, there's no movement in their facial expressions and their body is often quite rigid uh, because they're repressing so much in their body. See, as you're talking and describing this theoretical person, I'm thinking in my own head, I I would find that really difficult because you 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 read people's reactions and that then gives you an idea of whether they're involved in the conversation or they like you or they approve or whatever it is. You look for bodily clues to all of this as a way of communicating. Correct. So if you were using behavioural observation, um, what, what you would observe, as I said, is somebody who's quite um, rigid in their behavioural patterns. Yeah. Somebody's quite... Um, well, their facial muscles will be quite, as I said, uh, rigid, and there will be no movement in terms of uh, often their, um, their body structure. So if you're looking for um, behavioural contact, more difficult. If you're looking for behavioural analysis, that's okay, because you know what that type of person will come from. Um, and you need to, at the beginning of therapy, ask thinking questions. Not mm -hmm. or what you're feeling now. I mean, you, it's when you ask that, that's the bit. You need to get there eventually, but yeah. you, uh, you'll overwhelm them if you go in too early. Yeah. So you would ask thinking questions to say, well, you know, how's it been for you during the week? What's been happening for you? Has it been a um, difficult for you? What has the challenges been? Um, you wouldn't say, well, it's, it's interesting. I don't see any expression of feelings. Are you feeling anything at the moment as you're thinking that? Yeah. There's a time and place to ask that question. When you switch from the thinking channel to, do, to, to move towards helping the person think about uh, the process of an absent feeling with them, needs to come after you've got a working relationship with them, not before. Yeah. Do they dip in and dip out of that emotion? Yeah, yeah. Um, because my understanding yeah. of, of kind of schizoid is that they, they do touch base every so often, but it can be overwhelming, so they retreat again. So they kind of sometimes they're in and sometimes they're not. So you never quite know where mm. you are with them. <laughs> well... Again, the sequence is psychotherapy, but that's in a general process. You're completely right. I love going to zoos. And Jessica is now 25. She had a childhood of me going to lots of zoos with her. One yeah. of my friends, by the way, was in Tenerife. But anyway, the, I live in Manchester and there's a wonderful zoo in Chester. And I expect you've been yourself. Yeah, yeah. What they have got there is a wonderful meerkat area and meerkats are exactly what you've just said they will pop up and if there's too if they get overwhelmed by too many people peering at them they go down again yeah. and they pop up and then they go down again and you're completely right if we're going to use that analogy um if they popped up at a time where you think they're more contactable or their feelings are more on the surface through perhaps bodily expression or you intuitively think that that would be the time to attempt perhaps to explore their feelings if they're aware of them with their thinking the timing becomes crucial there yeah but you yeah. correct that would be the best time to get them when they um have popped up yeah some people call it a pop in, pop out therapy with the schizoid character, and understand that. I understand that very well, but the time and the timing needs to be very accurate. Yeah, and as well, you know, thinking about it from the the therapist or the counsellor's side, and maybe this is just me talking, but it's about not taking it personally if they do dip in and dip out. This is not about you in the relationship. It's a lot about them them getting overwhelmed at times. Mm. 
Well, a lot. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. But it's about, you know, we. I think we as therapists and counsellors need to be quite robust in ourselves to work with people that dip in and dip out of the relationship. Uh, the naive therapist is the therapist that believes that the only way to help somebody change is for, the, for them to get to feelings. Yes. Whether it be crying, whether it be anger, whether it be fear, whatever it is. Yeah. And that, there's a big trap with that especially with this type of person yeah and that is they will they'll just be too overwhelmed and you only see them again i quite like working with people like that to be perfectly honest because i'm not very good doing the feely stuff anyway i'm quite a logical person i love the diagrams and everything that we do so i can fit quite well with that client yeah yeah so you do that's that's great so at the beginning he would do a lot of educative therapy with yeah. this type of client spock would enjoy that immensely to have an hour of diagrams and uh, thinking discussions. And yeah. He would be absolutely in his element. Now, I was reading in the paper only yesterday something very interesting on this subject of thinking and feeling. Um, and somebody was talking about, well, let's backtrack. They have autistic traits. Yeah. Now, somebody with autistic traits, feelings would be anatomy. And in this sort of article, they were talking about, this person was talking about how um, they lost their, um, I don't know if it was their door, daughter or girlfriend, some tragedy. And he, he was saying he'd got a lot of stick because he wasn't, it didn't seem like he was grieving to yeah. feel it, the feelings. And he was saying people grieve different ways. And if you're like me, fairly autistically, then it, I can be crying on the inside and perhaps you'll not know. Yeah. So that really resonates, do you know what I mean, that what that client must be going through when people just think that they're an unfeeling person, that, you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, to a, on a similar vein, the Dr. Spock character, it's very similar, um, what we're talking about here. We're not talking about the Vulcan, we're talking about the human characteristics I'm putting alongside this is if, if they've spent a lifetime defending against the expression of feelings then they're more likely to grieve on the inside and you'll never know or show feelings on the inside and you'll never know yeah. now they tend to come to therapy because of problems in social relationships intimate relationships romantic relationships um, where the other person wants more intimacy from the per this person and wants an expression of their vulnerability and emotion. Yes, yeah. So it's, it's understandable, but it's also very difficult for them to express that. Yeah, because it's usually a defence against trauma. Yeah. So the therapy needs to be, like I've said, at the beginning particularly not through the channel of thinking eventually you need to get an integration of thinking feeling behaving however the other thing about this type of work with this type of profile it needs to be very slow and the therapist needs to be very patient yeah so what, as you're working through this process would you look at i want to say exercises but maybe that's the wrong word ways of exploring emotions and feelings in a logical way or thinking about especially in the beginning of therapy i might yeah teach them, PA, teach them techniques that you've just talked about so it's, not only is that um useful for somebody who thinks a lot but also it's very good in building up a robust trustful relationship yeah the timing is crucial when you shift a bit yes yeah you might say, you might, as you shift, because it's a big shift to suddenly say how you're feeling, but you might say, um, just what's interesting, are you thinking about the fact that you might be sad at the moment? Yeah. <laughs> See, I said you're thinking about the fact that you might be sad at the moment. Yes, yeah. 
Yeah. And th those are the sort of things I think that, that interest me, the, the way that we can think about feelings, you know, mm -hmm. think about the feeling as in where in the body are you feeling it? Do you know what I mean? Right. And things Great like question. that. Yeah. Great query question to somebody who's withdrawn and detached. Yeah. At the right time, another positive query is something like, uh, why you when the therapist might move to a relational stance and say something like, you know, as we're talking, I'm aware that you seem quite detached at this moment. Are you? Yeah. So it's relational in the sense that you're saying, I am aware. So that's what I mean by relational. But it's also asking a thinking question rather than the risk of overwhelming with a thinking, with a feeling query. Yeah. Yeah. It what about actually... modelling emotions? Is that something that they'd run for the hills with? <laughs> if you feel you've got a secure enough, robust relationship with them, I think if you move to a relational stance and shared that you, I don't know, you feel sad one morning because you'd run over a, I don't know, a squirrel on the road or something. That's fine. But what I don't think is really, which won't work, is if you start to show feelings. And... Yeah. So talk about them as in something happened rather than I am feeling this in this moment or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And therapy is, is slow and you need patience, this type of person. Now, if the therapist counter-transference is one of things like impatient and problem solving and getting the job done very quickly, then you're not the right therapist for this type of person. Yeah. Yeah. Or if you need a lot of validation yourself as a person. <laughs> Uh, well, if you expect it off the other person, yes. Yeah. But I think the problems a lot of have therapists have with a detached, disconnected type of counter we're talking here is they want they want to fix the person first before yeah. they get to know the person. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I've I've got a client that I think you know is schizoid. Yeah, I don't like labels and terms and things like that but that's the way that I think about her we've been seeing each other now for she's probably going on for six years and wow. she comes back religiously all the time and yeah. I will I can see when I look back how our relationship has changed throughout yeah. that there's been bumps in the road yeah. but she's always come back bless her yeah and you know um Dr. Spock is a Vulcan, so they they value um, thinking and don't value feelings. So that's the Vulcan race. Um, but the human race, it's much more about the split, if you like. Um, a schizoid means split mm -hmm. in the Greek process. Um, a split is a protection against um, trauma. Yeah. And a defense against exposing that vulnerability so you need to think very carefully and i used to do think a lot of this very carefully when i perhaps say to somebody after a couple of years or maybe even a year's got to get sort of withdrawn trace how about you try a group therapy i run a group how would you like to do therapy in a group now the advantage and disadvantage of that is simply this profile, number one, they will get feedback for a lot of people in the group and probably get their awarenesses. The other side of it is, of course, it might there may be too many feelings and they'll run away. Yeah. Or yes. especially. Yeah. Yeah. So on the on the sort of when you I think about it a lot, I've worked more I've worked more individually with this type of person, I have put them in a group. I don't say I haven't put them in a group, but it would be quite a long time on in therapy before I did. Yeah. 
that have to I, pay. This particular client that I'm thinking of, she does struggle in certain group situations. Yeah, absolutely, because she'll be she'll appear detached, but she'll be quite fragmented, and then people in the group will want, to, you know, there'll be a lot of counter tensions going on. For people. Yeah, yeah. I don't necessarily think somebody who's withdrawn and so split the group therapy is, um, you know, the right type of therapy. And I, and I could argue that it is, but it needs to be after quite a bit of individual therapy so that they've got a secure base with the therapist. Yes, yeah. That's what I'm thinking. For, for some people, it, it might push them into that next phase and challenge them a little bit and... You know, because I suppose, I don't know, would role play work with somebody, you know, not in the early days, again, obviously, but yeah, I mean, role playing emotions and how you imagine it would be if you felt this way. <laughs> it would work very well after, yeah, it would have to be quite yeah. a bit of time in therapy in terms of therapeutic sequence. And you have to really trust the therapist and it has yeah. to be done particular way but yes because it's interesting isn't it i'm not sure of the the actual percentages or whatever but how we make impressions on people it's very little the words that we say it's all about the tone of voice that we have you know our body language and everything that's the majority of communication mm -hmm. but for somebody that's quite what you were saying about, you know, not a lot of facial expression and very still and everything. It's really difficult to read those people in a social situation as well as in a therapy room. Yeah, so it needs patience. That's why I said yeah. the counter of the therapist is really important here uh, to analyse because the, because the therapist needs to come from a very neutral analytical place at the beginning particularly. Yeah. And Dr. Spock, in one of the episodes later on, he gets overwhelmed by feelings. Was it him or was it Data in Star Trek uh, Voyager? By date in, in Star Trek Voyager, which followed from the original Star Trek, you had a Dr. Spock character called Data, so it might have been him. But anyway, he gets totally overwhelmed by feelings and he gets incapacitated by these feelings that overwhelm him because he can't engage his thinking so he's, he, he, he's totally incapacitated and he just withdraws even more. So if you're going to, it's very important that you, you, you take this very gently and maybe even one feeling at a time. But remember, you're really, the end goal is helping the person integrate their split. Yeah. That's where you're going. But it has to be done in the right sequence of time, I believe. If a person's very split and very withdrawn and protect themselves against the expressions of feelings because they've been so traumatised, so hurt, so belittled, so humiliated, that they've had to split part of their personality, then it's a long-term therapy bit by bit. Yeah. Otherwise, the therapist repeats history. Yeah. Absolutely. It has to be done slowly. So, obviously, you're doing positive things with this client who you've been with six years yeah well yeah because they keep coming back again <laughs> yeah because they've got a relationship with you now to an extent where perhaps you've been able to move some towards some integration of this split yeah i think one of the things potentially in the relationship that i have with them is that they're very one track minded on relationships and overthink how it went if that makes sense whereas I can look at it from an objective point of view yeah, and say yeah. well maybe it wasn't that maybe in that moment they yeah. were feeling or thinking this yeah so they are able to take that from you yeah in the in the Dr Spock Vulcan character there is no desire to be integrated in fact the, their whole process is to stay in a thinking place because they don't value what they would call as the human desire for emotion. Yeah, because it is messy, Bob, and it does get in the way, doesn't it? <laughs> However, having said all that lot, I think in the human race, you know, there is a desire um, 
for expression of emotion in terms of connection. However, this type of person, we're talking about, I've just said, has been traumatized, belittled, humiliated, shamed, and so they've protected themselves by hiding their expression of emotions, just like the meerkat. And if there's a close proximity to the other, they may move away and you'll never reach them. Yeah. Are they, you know, you, you touched on the autism thing or whatever it is. Are they able to read other people's emotions or not? <clears throat> well, I remember thinking for myself very young that I was I had autism. And when I went to see my first therapist, one of the things I said to her, you know, uh, am I autistic because of the problems you have just talked about, um, which is being with all the appearance of being withdrawn, split off, detached, aloof. Uh, having no empathy or the allowing myself not to have empathy etc etc so I was thinking my little knowledge of autism anyway and I've been told I might have been autistic at the age very young so I asked my therapist um but I had a good relationship uh, with her before I asked her that question and she said no I don't think you are I think given the context of your history and the heavy traumatization uh, you're protection uh, against showing feelings or even being aware of feelings uh, has met, has um, diminished em empathy and you've done a pretty good job uh, protecting yourself. However, if you want to come to a place and have relationships and be more integrated and have empathy and all these things, we need to move to a different place. And I was with this therapist for nearly 30 odd years. Wow. In fact, she was ran the retreats that I talk, may have talked about on the air and some podcasts yeah. that I've just recently finished. Now, I wasn't with her for 30 years. Um, you know, I had, from therapy, I had a decade off and various other things. But psychological time and real time isn't the same thing. So I had that psychological connection for a very long time. I love and that, I, Bob. What's that? Psychological and real time. Isn't, the same I've thing. never heard that before. I like Anyways, that. I can hold that, people can hold that psychological connection as if it was yesterday, even if you don't see the person for 10 years. Yeah. I like that. So I'm a real advocate of, you know, six years. I like, really like that. And the fact with these, because the, the split is so, so deep and it's very different from the Vulcan process, the human process. Uh, it's far more, I think, there's an innate desire to have connection and to be right. able to um, show emotion. But the way they protect themselves is to cut off from that. Yeah, because we want to belong, Bob, don't we? As part of being human, one of the relational needs is to belong and for the other to initiate. And it's really difficult if you're... Yeah. A schizo because people aren't going to initiate contact <laughs> so you are i call this podcast dr spot profile or whatever it is but i don't want to discount the human the human i think the human um desire for connection yeah to express emotion is the is the value for me i don't value I know the Vulcans, of course, did, but I think in the human race, the desire for connection through emotion and feeling is what most people desire underneath all this. Yeah. Well, it's, getting the there. it's getting there. That's the bit. Yeah. And it's slowly. The therapist will take their time. That's the bit. Be patient. Yeah. See it as a defense against trauma. A defence against neglect, a defence against humiliation, a defence against shame. And you have to take your time. Yeah. Too. Yeah. Thank you for that, Bob. You're welcome. So what we'll be looking at next time is turning down the negative messages in our head. Good, if good it was easy to just turn them down. Oh. Well, it's not easy at all, but I look forward to talking about it. Okay, Bob, until next time. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show. 
Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.